you are new to Grace, welcome. We do have a little card that you can fill out and drop in the offering plate. Also, if you are new and you need to update your contacts, there is going to be a table in the Commons area that you can fill out any corrections with that. Also, today we are having our potluck to also then usher in our annual report. So if you perhaps forgot to bring a dish for the potluck, it's okay, I'm sure there'll be plenty to share. So please join us after church in the uh, gym for our potluck and then back in the sanctuary for our annual report. All right, well next I would like to welcome up Doug Hansen for another announcement. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, ben, this is a message for you. If you would please open up your bulletins, pull out the uh, bulletin insert, the Friday night flight at the top. Okay, I've seen some men out there that are not digging in the bulletins. <laughs> if you're a male, you're 15 years old or older, I want you to have this in your hand right now. And it has Friday night flight at the top. Camp. <laughs> All right, Friday night flight. It's not made. There's actually just to uh, make you all feel at ease. There's no <laughs> fighting going on there. And there won't be watching any fights. Um, no, this is a, a event we've had uh, four times in the past. We haven't had it for a couple years now, but we're doing it this year. It's not only for our church, but we've invited some of the local churches to send men. Uh, here as well. We'll be here if you uh, if you're reading along, you'll see that it's Friday night, February 7th, beginning at 6:30 here. There'll be a meal here, and if you'd like to attend, uh, it'll cost you seven dollars for the meal. But don't let that stop you. We can afford that. We can uh, we can make sure that you get fed. Um, let's see, 6:30. Uh, call the church office beforehand so we know that you're coming and we can order enough food. Uh, the big question for us is, why do we do this? Let me read something from Matthew chapter 5, beginning of verse 27. You have heard that it said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to go into hell. Man, this is, this is serious. This is serious business, and we don't want to skip over this. Here at our church, we think it's our responsibility to deal with this type of sin. And we want to give every man in this church the tools that he needs to live a life of purity. Therefore, we put together this evening uh, where you can learn about using the power of the Holy Spirit that comes from Christ. Uh, and we've invited Tom Simshauser, uh, who I've known for five years, just a great guy to share with us. And he's, he's going to share a message called Trusting God. And uh, yes, you can even trust in God to help you live a life in purity. This is, uh, event is open to all men 15 years and older. We will be having a very frank discussion. Uh, those who are uh, who have attended in the past have commented that every man should uh, take part in this. So if you have not been uh, part of it in the past, plan on being here. It's February 7th, uh, Friday night at 6.30. And even if you haven't gone through it, come back again to support the guys that, uh, that will be here. Um, following that, if you notice the second part of the of the insert, there's a, we're talking about a blue <coughs> and that's basically basic training. We give you uh, five days, uh, an hour and a half each day of uh, basically uh, training on tools and techniques you can use to live a, a, pure, a life of purity. So, if you would, mark your calendars, put some time aside, that's February 7th, and starting at 6.30 Friday night, and put some time in your calendar then for the camp to follow. Thank you.
We serve that same great God all week, every week. And so to that end, uh, we once a month have what we call This Time Tomorrow, where we talk about how uh, the workplace, how our faith influences us in the workplace. And so to that end, we have Jason Austin with us here this morning to talk a little bit about how his faith impacts him at work throughout the week. And so, Jason, to start, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do during the week? Sure thing. Uh, well, I'm a web developer at a marketing agency, so uh, much of what I do involves sitting at a desk, working through a lot of lines of code, uh, solving people's problems, whether or not they know what those problems are to start with, uh, <laughs> and uh, trying to use some actual data to figure out how to make their business better. Oh. What are some of the, the highlights that work for you, or how do you, what are different ways that you see God at work? I'd say the main highlight is just that ability to solve those problems, find them, solve them, make people's lives better, make their uh, businesses better, and um, it's just a very rewarding aspect in that. Um, and that's actually an area that I do see God working in, in my life for sure. Is you know, it's not uncommon to get to a point on a project where you're just uh, there's no there's no forward momentum anymore. You know? A quick prayer walk around the office, and all of a sudden my brain is turned on again and ready to go. What are some challenges you face in terms of living out your faith? Like, what are some ways you can pray to you go through? I think a lot of the challenges come down to communication and a willingness to share openly and honestly with people. It's much easier in the busyness of an office setting to get wrapped up in the details of the work that needs to be done and not be real with the people around us and form real relationships. Let's pray for Jason and all of us as we uh, head up into the work week tomorrow. Father, we thank you for Jason and his commitment to live out his faith uh, in an office setting, in his workplace. And pray that you would give him the ability to do his work well in a way that honors you and glorifies you and help him to make those real and meaningful connections and friendships in the office setting that would not be so driven and focused on work that um, relationship would fall by the wayside, but that you provide opportunity for them to make real connections and to, uh, yeah, just build real friendships with people where you can share his life with them. Um, that you be glorified for, as each of us leave here and head out into the workplace this week, that you would be honored by how each of us goes about our work and that you would constantly remind us that we live and work for your glory, not for personal gain or personal reasons, ultimately, but for your glory to see your name, your glory spread throughout the earth. Help us to do that well as we go um, into our workplaces this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I'd invite you to a moment of silence as we prepare our hearts for worship this morning.
pay the price of sin and death for us. But also, Lord, we ask that as each day goes by, that uh, you will give us our daily bread and that you will reign in us. In Jesus' name.
share just a little bit. Rosemary Essler is here to share about something that took place that really revolves around their son, Jim. You should know Jim is age 59, and Jim is in a sort of bad stage of his life. Uh, he has brain cancer and is in hospice care, and each day sort of losing more of his abilities. But there's some special event that took place about a week ago, and you should know that it happened, and I think it's a message for all of us. So Rosemary's here to share what she had the opportunity to do with uh, Jim's friend. Well, our, our son Jim was very excited because a good friend of his that he had worked with at Cardiac Pacemaker um, had called and said she was flying in to just to support him and love on him and they would talk about old times and good things. And she had just been to see the movie that Mel Gibson directed, The Passion, and she was upset by it. She wanted Jim to explain it to her as a Christian. Jim called me and he said, Mom, can you come over? <laughs> so Mom said, sure, we'll be there. We made a nice dinner and we sat down after dinner. We were talking about um, the movie. And it's important to know that Helene is a little Jewish lady who grew up in New York. So I puzzled and puzzled about how to tell her about Jesus. I come to tell her about the blood sacrifice. It came to me late one night when I couldn't sleep that I should tell her. We started off with Abraham um, going to sacrifice Isaac, but God provided the lamb. We talked about um, the Jews wandering in um, Egypt, and we talked about the Passover. These are all things that she was very familiar with. We talked about the tabernacle sacrifices, and we talked about the temple sacrifices. And slowly she began to see it and to put it all together. And then we talked about Jesus. She looked at me straight in the eye and she said, I get it. <laughs> and we, we uh, rejoiced. I want to share with you Ephesians 1.4 which summarizes the whole thing. Long ago, even before he made the world, God chose us to be his very own. Through what Christ would do for us, he decided then to make us holy in his eyes without a single fault. We who stand before him are covered with his love. And may I add, with his blood blood of Christ. Do you get it? Thank you, Rosemary, and I think this is what we've tried to do. When someone comes to Christ, we're kind of following those little examples in, in Luke 15 that says, when the shepherd found that lost sheep, he was rejoicing. When the lady found those lost coins, she rejoiced, and when the Father saw the son who had gone astray, he rejoiced. Let's rejoice. There's a new life in heaven. Thank you.
And we look to you for the faith to trust you for provisions and trials of tomorrow. You have given to us special access to your throne, access provided through Christ, and the guidance, insight, and comfort offered by your Holy Spirit. And we come to you now. Together, God, we, the body of believers that we call grace, come before you acknowledging that we, as a body, fall short of your desires for us. As individuals also, God, we fall short. We sin. We acknowledge and confess our disobedience, our pride, selfishness, rebellious in independence. We ask and confess all the actions and the attitudes that grieve you and your spirit. We also confess our failures to do that which you have commanded. We so often fail to be your mouth, your hands, your feet, with our families and neighbors. We so often fail to be light, peace, and hope in our communities. We often fail to be voices of encouragement and testimonies of grace in the workplace. For these sins, both those that we commit and for the good that we omit, we ask your forgiveness. But Lord, we have much to be thankful for. This time here together, this place, the freedoms that you have given to us, your provision. We thank you for the, the new life that was shared a few minutes ago. And, and we pray for Eileen as, as she continues in her new walk with you, as she is. Today, we will be reflecting on the various aspects of the daily bread that you provide. We are thankful. We are thankful for the leadership that you have provided to us in this church, the staff, and their vision, their passion. We bring them before you also that you would continue to encourage them and give them your insight and your vision. Lord, we have many things to, to bring before you as concerns. situations in our, our country, we ask that our leaders, whether they be in our local, state, or national governments, we pray for those leaders and ask that they would be finding ways to not only coming together and, and healing our country, but that they might in some way be looking to you as the source of healing and purpose. We have a refugee family here in our congregation, and we seek your guidance for ways that we can be coming alongside them and helping them in, in their transitions. We bring before you the needs of this body, whether they be emotional, spiritual, financial, health. We know there are medical needs, and you know them, Lord, and we bring those to you also. We pray for our missionaries, those who give of themselves and of their lives to share with others that the whole world might know the name of Jesus. Father, we acknowledge that you have been faithful, you are faithful. 
holy, holy, holy. Lord, we come into your presence affirming, declaring how holy is your name. We pray as a church we might not only hear that beautifully played or at times sing it enthusiastically and with passion, but more importantly, we pray that we might live a life of faith reflecting that declaration. That you, Holy Father, you, Holy Son, you, Holy Spirit, might be magnified in all that we do and think and are. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. One of the great principles about prayer that each of us must learn is to put God's interest first. Whenever we pray, our ultimate desire is not to petition God for what we want or even need, but first to come into his courts with thanksgiving, into his presence with praise. And therein, the Lord's Prayer, the Disciples' Prayer, begins exactly with that in mind. Thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. Thine is the glory. Before we pray for ourselves, we first hallow God's name. We declare, as the offertory reminds us, to affirm how holy he is. But after doing that, it's, it's very right and proper that we demonstrate faith by praying specifically for, for real needs. Our work, our families, our homes, our friends, our finances. Because those concerns are important to us, they are important to a Heavenly Father whose interest is so fixated on us as well. And the Lord models for His disciples then and for us today how right and proper it is for us to pray persistently and patiently and passionately. So after we pray for God's name, and for God's kingdom, and for God's will, it's then after those three petitions that we have three personal petitions. We pray that God would give us this day our daily bread, that he would forgive us our sins, our trespasses, our debts, as we forgive those of others. That he would lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Notice how these personal petitions focus on our physical needs, our emotional needs, and our spiritual needs. We come today to the fourth petition, or the first of these individual personal petitions, and we pray together, give us this day our daily bread. Seven words. But seven words that, that summarize so many spiritual truths that we would be wise to camp around four different aspects of this very short petition. And as we do so, I think under each of those four aspects, there are a myriad of questions that they're asking and answering. So look at this phrase, look at this petition, and let's focus first on the first word where the, where the, the, 
the, the source is focused upon. The prayer is, give us this day our daily bread. Jesus invites us to pray this prayer, recognizing that our Heavenly Father is the source of all good gifts. And Jesus is modeling for us the importance of petitioning Him specifically to answer our daily needs. But as I think about this petition, there are all sorts of questions that I raised. Am I really expecting God to respond and to provide for my physical needs? Am I totally, are you totally dependent upon God? Are you and I not responsible to provide for our family, to work hard and thoroughly? Well, the answer to all of these questions is yes. Yes, God answers totally our physical needs. And yes, God expects for us to be totally dependent on Him. And yes, God expects us to work to provide for our families, all the while recognizing that He ultimately is the provider. The farmer in the South reminds us of great wisdom when he says the best place to Pray for potatoes is at the end of a hoe. <laughs> the same farmer had a friend who came to see the beautiful garden carved out of a rocky hillside. And his friend admired the bountiful produce that came from what was a rocky garden area. You and God have done a great job, said the friend. Yeah, but you should have seen this place when God had it all by himself. <laughs> Do we understand truly that back of the loaf is the flour, and back of the flour is the wheat, and back of the wheat is the sun, and the showers, and the seasons, and the Savior? Jesus is desiring to teach us that God is responsible for that which we enjoy. The morning sunrise, the day's warmth during the summer, and the protect protection from the cold winter, the cool breezes, the mountain lake, the, the baby's cry, God is ultimately responsible. The self-made man, the self-made woman is a lie from the pit of hell. To recognize that God is the ultimate giver results in thankful hearts. But when you and I, wittingly or unwittingly, forget that fact, when we ignore that God is the ultimate provider, you and I rob ourselves of joy and appreciation and thankfulness. That's the mindset of many in our society. And consequently, many go through life expecting certain things. As if there's a sense of entitlement. I deserve this, many say. And when this type of attitude takes root even, yes, within our lives, Rather than being thankful, we become very presumptuous. We ask God why it took so long for him to respond to our beckoning. And if God's good gifts are delayed, we can become bitter and resentful. But when we intentionally pray, give us this day our daily bread, we do so not as an impetuous child, give me, but 
rather one who understands the source of all good gifts comes from God. God is not a genie in a bottle. And God is not a vending machine in which we put in a prayer expecting to get something in re return. But rather when we pray to the source of all good gifts, give, we forthrightly declare our abject need and dependence upon him to supply. The hymn has said it well. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. When we pray this first word, we signify trust. We imply dependency. And God desires that you and I be pilgrims on this journey of life, realizing that he supplies. The manna that the Israelites received in their wandering in the promise, toward the promised land was a visible reminder that from heaven, from God, the giver of all good gifts, comes, yes, even daily bread. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. But look at this petition and focus on that next word and the other that is similar to it in the phrase, give us this day our daily bread. Notice the seekers. <laughs> the, these pronouns suggest other questions that demand being asked and answered. We've made the point before that in this Lord's Prayer, the disciples' prayer, not once do we see I, thee, my, but rather we see we, us, our. The pronouns are all plural. So who are the others represented by those pronouns? Who are those with whom I pray? Thousands upon thousands have prayed this prayer and died of starvation. Why has God answered the prayer for you and me, but has not answered the prayer for others? Could it be that Jesus invites us to pray this prayer, but not selfishly? Could it be that as we pray this prayer for ourselves, we pray it collectively for all people? Could it be that as God answers the prayer for one, he answers it for all? But then the question is, if that's the case, why will many die today because of starvation? The fact that this is so, is that not a statement of God's insufficiency? Or his inability to fully answer the needs of those who cry this prayer? But could it be that that's not a statement against God, it's rather a statement against us? Could it be that it's not so much a matter of provision, but a matter of distribution? Years ago, I had the opportunity of directing a junior high camp in Kansas. It was the church camp. There were about 100 participants. Like a lot of different camps, there were different themes for the day. And on one particular day, we focused on what it means to pray for those who are so vulnerable, especially those who that day would die because of starvation. In other words, what does it mean to be a world-class Christian? Not a worldly Christian, but a Christian with a worldview of an awareness of issues larger than the immediate environs would suggest. Now give credit where credit's due. I, 
I read an article that intrigued me as I was preparing to direct this camp, and I filed it away, and I wanted to circle back and implement it just to see what would happen. It made an impression on me. I know it made an impression on those campers, and I'm thinking it might make an impression on you. In the dining room were 13 tables. Around each of those tables sat eight of the campers. And we determined before the campers came to go through the line to come into the dining hall to identify the different tables to represent the world by population. So we had one table marked Africa that represented 10% of the world's population. One table was marked South America that represented 8%. One represented North America with her 6% of the world's population. Two were marked Europe representing 17% of the population. And eight of those 13 tables were marked Asia to represent 59% of the world's population. At each of those tables would sit eight people. When the lunch bell rang, the campers lined up as they did the previous days, ready to eat pizza or uh, hamburgers or sloppy joes or whatever was on the menu that day. But I explained that we were going to do something different. We randomly passed out one of the country's areas to all the 100 campers. And I said, when you come into the dining hall, find your country, find your continent, and sit there. When everyone was seated, I explained that we were going to do for the new meal what the world does with the bread allotted to them. Those seated at the table representing Africa got one loaf of bread. Those at the table of South America received one and a half loaves of bread. Those in North America received three loaves of bread. Europe received two and a half loaves. Each table of those students, campers, that sat at the Asia tables received one half loaf of bread. Now think about that. Picture yourself at one of the tables. How would you feel if you were at an Asian table and the eight of you looked at that one half of a loaf? And what would you feel if you were at a North America table and had three loaves of bread that the eight of you would look at? To make matters more complicated, I identified five campers who had the footstuff to go against the grain. And I approached each of these five campers and I said this. Uh, I explained a little bit about what we were going to do. The fact that they would randomly get a table setting. Here's what I want you to do. When you get to your table and your group starts to pass around that loaf of bread or that half loaf of bread or those loaves of bread depending on where you were seated, I want you to get half of your allotment as a table. So if you are in North America, I want you to get one and a half loaves for yourself. If you're at an Asian table with a half a loaf, I want you to get half of that loaf. And you're going to get some pushback, but for the sake of this experiment, I want you to do that because it will make a point that I think is important to make. So as the meal began, you can imagine uh, how the different tables started passing around their bread and what they felt when that, when that one particular cancer would get more than his or her allotment. You can, you can hear the ribbing. Hey, that's not fair. Or if you do that, what will happen to the rest of us? Even here in the North America, if you get one and a half times uh, more than your share. As the meal continued, people from the 
Asia tables with the other tables. And there were all sorts of dynamics represented there. And those from the more wealthy countries had to, had to determine how they would respond. There was good nature laughing through it, but there was a point when it got to be testing. And we understood the point of the experiment. And we began praying more intentionally the phrase, give us this day our daily bread. The pronouns in this petition remind us that if one is hungry, then no one is well fed. But there's another dynamic in this petition. When we pray for our daily bread, we also offer ourselves as vessels through whom God's provision might come to others who are hungry. You remember the little girl who prayed about something which seemed like a legitimate request. Her birthday came and went, and a skeptical friend bemoaned, I suppose your God forgot about it. No, she said. I think God told somebody about the gift, and they forgot about it. <laughs> I believe that God desires that everyone be fed, clothed, cared for. And that hardly is the case. The issue could be not with the Lord, but with me. Could it be that I have simply failed to share? Now, I know that in this, in this room, we cannot feed the millions, the billions who are starving. But we can respond to that next one in our world whom we meet with legitimate needs. And this raises the whole ministry of the food distribution. It raises the whole value of the bread ministry, of the Meals on Wheels ministry of this church. Many of you routinely volunteer at Feed My Starving Children. Ours is the unique opportunity to stand in the gap that God has entrusted to us and to respond. And by God's grace, he has poured out abundance in our lives. May you and I be vessels through whom we reach out to others. As I speak and think about the food distribution, now in its, uh, what, 13th, going on 14th year of ministry, I understand that, that vision needs to be constantly fueled. Firewood must be added to fire. And I understand the, the syndrome of compassion and weariness can sometimes set in. I would encourage us as a church to pause and ask the Lord of the harvest to refuel our vision for that and other compassionate ministries of this church. Too often times we say that what's important is saving a person's soul. All the while we forget about his physical needs. And other times we can focus on the physical needs while neglecting the spiritual. But Jesus would remind us that it's not binary, it's not either or, it's both and. If a freezing man's knees are knocking so loudly, if a starving person's stomach is growling so loudly, then he or she can hardly hear the gospel of good news. Therefore, when we in affluent America pray, give us this day our daily bread, are we not praying that God might change sometimes our heart of stone into hearts of flesh? 
a thought struck me as I was meditating on this phrase. Next week, we will focus on asking God to forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. To the degree that we forgive others, oh Lord, might you forgive us. What would happen if we applied that same thought pattern to this particular phrase? Give us this day our daily bread as we give bread to others. In other words, Lord, meet my physical needs as I respond to the physical needs of others. A man was once reported having a horrible dream. I dreamed, said the man, that my Lord took my Sunday offering and multiplied it by ten. And that became my weekly income. In no time, I had lost my cable TV. I had to give up my new car. I couldn't make my house payment. However, after all, what can a person do with $10 a week? If the Lord took your offering today and multiplied it by 10, how would that change your standard of living? My hunch is for some of you, your standard of living would increase. But for most, it would drastically be reduced. The issue is not to give more. The issue is how we might keep less. Our lives as Christians are like a bottle of rich perfume. And the fragrance is Christ. And you and I are invited to dispense his fragrance to the world. And that fragrance cannot be dispensed if the bottle is tightly sealed. But if we break the seal and dispense it, not only will we find ourselves manifesting the fragrance of Christ for others, we will, we will smell it ourselves. This petition invites us to acknowledge the source of our bread. It identifies the seekers of the bread. But what about the schedule? We pray, give us this day our daily bread. Is Jesus teaching us that it is only appropriate to pray for daily needs? Are we wrong to pray for the morrow? Should we not be concerned and neglect insurance or pension plans or savings? I think not. God calls us to use common sense. And even in the case of the Israelites, he gave them manna for six days. But on the sixth day, he gave them manna not only for that day, but for the next day. He provided food for the animals, not only daily, but he gave them the sense of storing for the coming winter. And similarly, I think God calls us to gather bread daily with the thought of our getting through not only this 24 hours, but also the Sabbath periods of our lives. Some have benefited from thinking about our finances, of spending 70%, of saving 20%, of giving 10%. I agree with John Wesley. Make as much as you can, save as much as you can, give as much as you can. Live not tight-fisted, but live with an open hand. Notice that in this prayer of some 70 words, Jesus emphasizes twice about our daily needs. Give us this day our daily bread. I believe it's because God would want us to live one day at a time, not to be anxious about the unknown tomorrows, but to live in a moment-by-moment -moment 
dependency upon God. The early church understood this principle. In that culture, most laborers were paid at the end of each day. And therefore, they, their prayer was focused on the immediate needs that they had. With that pay, they would buy the day's food. The area was an agrarian culture. And you can imagine how hard the hardship they would suffer uh, during inclement weather. But the bread, the manna that the Israelites received, as we said before, came from heaven almost as an object lesson that it was, that it was coming from God himself. And our very wealth has contributed to our faithlessness and sometimes to our spiritual bankruptcy. The need for God today has been eroded. God invites us to realize that he supplies day by day. We've seen the source and the seeker, the schedule. Finally, let's look at the substance, the bread itself. Now, what does this bread refer to? Undeniably, it refers to the brown type of bread. But it also refers to the green type. In fact, sometimes the slang for money is called bread. God supplies not only the food, but the finances. So Jesus taught us to pray for our daily bread, not for our daily cake, for our needs, not our greeds. But how do we determine when we have enough bread? How much bread is too much? Am I right or wrong to pray for a home, for a car, for a particular job, for particular benefits? I mean, at, at what point am I not praying for needs but for greeds? Well, that seems like a highly personal and a highly spiritual question. Personally, if God gives you peace, about praying very specifically about these or other matters that our good Father desires to give us the desires of our hearts, then I would say pray on. And he can say no or go or woe. So pray for that home, for that car, for that opportunity, but then realize that ultimately God holds the deed to that home, to that car. And he is the one positioning you in that particular job, all for his honor and for his glory. We are stewards, caretakers of that which he entrusts to us. We are not the captain of our souls. There are two signs which indicate, I believe, when we are praying for greeds and not needs. One is the sin of anxiety. Too much bread or not enough bread causes anxiety. You remember the Proverbs? Remove me from falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. Lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the Lord, the name of my God. In his farewell speech, Jesus explained the reason why God gave the Israelites bread. So that they might know that no one lives by bread alone. But rather by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So anxiety is one indicator that we are praying wrongly, and selfishness is the other. In other words, do you live to eat, or do you eat to live? Do you live so that you might make bread, 
Or do you make bread so that you can point others to life in Jesus Christ? The key is the motivation of why we want God to answer that prayer. The source, give. The seekers, you and I. The schedule, daily, this day. The substance, bread. May God be faithful as he responds to this petition. A quick story. In 1981, nearly 39 years ago, Linda and I were preparing to leave the seminary culture and to go to the first pastorate that I would have. We did not know where that would be. We did not know when God would give that opportunity. We had all sorts of bills. Bills that came from our time there at seminary. We had Audrey, who at the time was a year and a half. Our car had uh, numerous problems. And I was anxious. I was anxious. I am an object lesson of what I just shared with you. Thankfully, Linda practices what I preach. <laughs> <laughs> and she just uh, very patiently reminded me that the Lord who brought us this far will continue revealing as we trust him. The seminary had a uh, concert. It was a building about the size of this worship center. Noel Paul Stuckey came there to Trinity Seminary and, and gave a, a wonderful concert I will never forget. Noel Paul Stuckey, as in the famous trio Peter, Paul, and Mary, and during that concert, he sang a song which he wrote, Then the Quail Came. The song invites us to think about how the Lord not only gave manna from heaven to the Israelites, but also fed them by quail at strategic times. Maybe right now you're going through a desert. May these words speak to your heart about how God delights to give you this day your daily quail. Journey is crazy, I heard 
someone say it is rage? How long will it be till we realize our folly and get back to where we were safe? Then the quail came, falling like the dew on the ground. The quail Will then conclude our worship. 